The President of the United States, Harry S. Truman, 32nd person to serve as the American nation's chief executive. A man to whom many millions of people look for guidance. A man whose responsibilities are today as great and whose influence as far-reaching as any other man on earth. On the walls of President Truman's office are portraits of George Washington and Simon Bolivar, which indicate his aims and ideals. The little town of Lamar, Missouri was Harry S. Truman's birthplace. Here in the rugged farmlands of Midwestern United States, he began the life and career which has taken him so far. On this quiet small town street in a very unpretentious little house which his father had built amid the simple rural surroundings, the future president of the United States was born on May 8, 1884. The nearby somewhat larger town of Independence became the Truman home when Harry was seven years old. Here, as a serious-minded country boy, he grew up. Here he went to church, and in the Sunday school he met the six-year-old little girl who now shares with him the famous White House in the nation's capital as his wife. In Independence, he attended public school and became fired with ambition. In this small town drugstore, he worked after school on his first job at $3 a week. The big town of Kansas City was not very far away. And while still attending high school, young Harry Truman journeyed here every afternoon for part-time employment on a newspaper, the Kansas City Star. His job was wrapping newspapers, which flowed in what seemed like a constant avalanche from the grinding presses. Not a very exciting position for an ambitious young man, but it paid more than twice as much as the drugstore job. When 17 years old, Harry Truman became a railroad worker as a timekeeper on the Santa Fe Railroad. This was after he had graduated from high school and his father had suffered financial reverses which eliminated Harry's chances of going to college and necessitated his going to work full time and in earnest. But his ambition carried him on and within less than a year he had gained for himself a position as clerk in a large bank. Then followed 10 strenuous years as a Missouri farmer and a distinguished service defending the flag of the United States during the First World War. Shortly after being discharged from the Army, Harry Truman and a soldier friend established this clothing store in Kansas City. But along came the National Depression, which caused the business to fail. And it is to the everlasting credit of Harry S. Truman that he slaved for 15 years to pay back every dollar that was owed. His former partner, who still owns the store, and the president are still the best of friends. Today, as through the intervening years during which Harry S. Truman has struggled and risen to his high position in national and world affairs, the big frame house in Independence, Missouri, has continued to be home to him. It is now called the Summer White House, and he returns at every opportunity which his presidential duties permit. Harry S. Truman is fundamentally an average American, not rich, but not poor, not sophisticated, but far from naive, an early riser and a hard worker, and very much a family man. Having lunch with his family on the backyard lawn of his rural summer white house in the little town of Independence is symbolic of the democratic principles which motivate the life of this leader of the people of the United States. The family is equally unpretentious and American. To the president, the first lady of the land is known as Bess, 
the only girl he ever courted, and they are bound by a deep and abiding devotion. Their daughter, Mary Margaret, is their only child. Here, the president is seen with his sister, Mary Truman, and their mother, Mrs. Martha Truman, well past 90 years of age, to whom he is extremely devoted. This grand old lady still lives near the family farm, where Harry spent his boyhood, and she taught him the first lessons of being religiously good, economically thrifty, and socially fair and honest, lessons which the president has never forgotten. In spite of the heavy weight of her many years, Mother Truman is surprisingly active. And in spite of the high office to which her son has ascended, she still never loses an opportunity of giving him a mother's advice. Her favorite challenge is, be good, Harry. The president has never lost interest in the family farmlands, which he still retains. Of his own earlier years on the farm, the president's mother says, Harry could plow a furrow straighter than any other boy in the county. It was while Harry Truman was a farmer that his political career began. He became interested in county politics for the betterment of conditions for the common man in his district. His fertile acres are tilled and harvested by his younger brother Vivian and Vivian's son. Many of the fine local roads as well as public establishments are the result of Harry Truman's early political efforts. It's a long way from plowing the straightest furrow of any farm boy in his county to the capital of the United States. But Harry Truman came to the national capital as senator from Missouri in 1934, and he brought with him the unpretentious integrity of his Midwestern farm folk and the determination to be economically thrifty and socially fair and honest. The fate of all the civilized nations of the earth hung in the balance at the time of the fourth inauguration of Franklin D. Roosevelt as President of the United States. Harry S. Truman had been one of President Roosevelt's staunchest supporters. He had been elected by a popular vote of the people as Vice President, the man upon whom these greatest of all history's grave responsibilities would fall in case anything should happen to President Roosevelt. No one knew what the future held in store. Little did anyone realize how soon Harry Truman was destined to shoulder the burden of state and carry on to completion the great work which Franklin D. Roosevelt had already come so close to fulfilling. Harry S. Truman takes the oath as Vice President of the United States. Being Vice President of the United States in the most difficult and fateful time in the nation's history established this native Missourian as a national statesman. Fill the place left vacant by the sudden death of Franklin D. Roosevelt, Harry S. Truman became the 32nd President of the United States on the evening of April 12, 1945. <laughs> President Truman quickly and skillfully assumed all of Franklin D. Roosevelt's responsibilities. Among the many important problems and missions of duty was the United Nations Conference of International Organization at San Francisco, California, to which the president journeyed by plane. At 
San Francisco's Hamilton Field, the president is welcomed by a host of high-ranking officers and world diplomats, ambassadors, ministers, secretaries of foreign affairs, the governor of California, United States senators, and many other equally important governmental representatives from all the continents of the earth. Diplomatic greetings were followed by meeting the military. The president inspects the Guard of Honor, his first formal inspection of a military unit since he became president of the United States. When he came abreast of the band leader, Mr. Truman stepped aside to thank him for his selection of the music. His greetings and official inspection of the Guard of Honor completed, the President enters his automobile, and to the cheers of the soldiers stationed at the field, he leads a cavalcade of more than a hundred cars and scores of motorcycle police escorts, which moves on its way toward San Francisco. Official delegates of the 50 United Nations had been gathered in San Francisco for the purpose of drafting and signing the historic World Charter. President Truman did not visit the conference to urge its delegates to ratify and sign the charter, for that had already been agreed upon. He came, however, to close the conference with a fervent plea that the charter's tenets should be translated into long-lasting and inviolate deeds. His first words to his audience were, oh, what a great day this can be in history. And his words were spoken with homespun directness and the deep sincerity of a prayer. In referring to the conference and the world charter, the president said with equal depth of feeling, the world must now use it. If we fail to use it, we shall betray all those who have died in order that we might meet here in freedom and safety to create it. If we seek to use it selfishly, for the advantage of any nation or any small group of nations, we shall be equally guilty of that betrayal. This charter is only the beginning, that it must be made to live, and the fact that there is such a charter is ample cause for universal and profound thanksgiving to Almighty God. In closing his speech, the president said, let us not fail to grasp this supreme chance to establish a worldwide rule of reason, to create an enduring peace under guidance of God. President Truman's appearance in New York City on October 27, 1945, in connection with the nation's first Navy Day after the victorious completion of the greatest war in all history, also marked his first official visit to the great metropolis. His first official act was to personally commission the United States Navy's new supercarrier named to commemorate his distinguished predecessor, Franklin D. Roosevelt. President Truman said, in commissioning this ship, the American people are honoring a stalwart hero of this war who gave his life in the service of his country, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and it is a symbol of our commitment to help the peace-loving nations of the world to stop any future international gangsters. In the city's spacious Central Park, more than a million persons gathered to hear President Truman declare the nation's policy in world affairs, that the United States seeks no international expansion or selfish advantage, the return of sovereign rights to all peoples deprived of them by force, no territorial changes, for all peoples the choosing of their own form of government, our assisting defeated enemy states to establish democratic governments, disapproval of governments established by force, 
and equal rights for all to the trade and raw materials of the world. In New York Harbor, 51 warships of the mightiest Navy the world has ever known were anchored to be reviewed by Harry S. Truman, President, and their Commander-in-Chief. The Fighting Missouri flagship of the Pacific Fleet which decimated the Japanese Navy and brought victory over Japan and namesake of the state in which Harry Truman grew up as a farmer lad serves as host to him as Commander-in-Chief. The president inspects the place on the Missouri's deck where the historic surrender of the Japanese took place. A large plaque marks the spot where the war was brought to a close. He sits down at the same table where victors and vanquished signed the papers of surrender to add his name to the ship's register. With natural pride, the president inspects the mighty ship's personnel, men who so recently had manned the big guns that wrecked Japan's sea power and blasted her coastline fortification. After which he went aboard the destroyer Renshaw, which had come alongside to carry him on his review of the seven mile long array of other warships in the harbor. As the review ship moved slowly up the river harbor, both banks of which were lined with millions of people, and more than a thousand warplanes moved swiftly through the sky overhead, each veteran warship boomed its peacetime thunderous salute as their commander-in-chief passed by. Yes, Harry Truman has come a long way from the farmlands of Missouri to his place of honor in the national capital of the United States. Private trains bring him to this depot where huge crowds today greet the arrival of this president who once worked as a low paid employee on a railroad in the Midwest. A boy who once wrapped newspapers so that they might be delivered to farmers and small town folk in Missouri now has his name emblazoned in big front page bull type on newspapers throughout the world. And the rich treasury of the United States of America is a responsibility of this man who once worked as a humble clerk in a small bank. He has brought to the White House his presidential residence, the ideologies of a family man ideologies which are a staunch and sturdy foundation for his important duties of state. He has brought to the capital of the United States a forcefulness and homespun integrity which sustain man's faith in the peacetime future. No other president of the United States has been called upon to do so much in such a brief period of time that is of such great importance to the future security and prosperity of all mankind.
but President Harry S. Truman has met each emergency and issue with a fortitude, ability, and fairness which have won for him the confidence and faith of the people of the United States and the rest of the world. But it's necessary for us under the Constitution of the United States every four years to get out and have a scramble for the presidency. We're having that right now. And I'm going around over the country facing such wonderful people as you to tell you exactly what the domestic issues are in this campaign and try to convince you that the Democratic Party is the party of the common people. I was born in Lamar, Missouri on May 8, 1884. In 1890, when I was six, we moved to Independence. My father was operating a farm out of town. I made a number of new acquaintances and became interested in one in particular, Bess Wallace. We went to Sunday school and public school from the fifth grade through high school together. When I graduated from high school in 1901, both I and my family expected there would be some chance for some more education. But difficulties overtook us, and we lost both the family farm and the home place in Independence. I got a job as a timekeeper on a railroad construction outfit. In 1906, I went back to my parents' new farm, where I stayed until the war came along. In March 1918, we sailed for France aboard the George Washington. Little girl, don't cry, I must say goodbye. Don't you hear the bugle call? Aboard ship, we watched New York's skyline diminish and wondered whether we'd be heroes or corpses. Most of us got by without being either. In July, the colonel sent for me. Harry, how would you like to command a battery? I said, well, sir, I hope to be able to do that someday. He said, all right, you'll take command of battery D tomorrow. They went to the front under my command. I returned to civilian life in May 1919. I was 35 years old. The next month, I married Bess Wallace. Five years later, our daughter Margaret was born. In the meantime, Eddie Jacobson and I made plans to open a men's furnishing goods store in Kansas City. He was my canteen sergeant during the war. We did a flourishing business for about a year and a half, and then came the squeeze of 1921. Jacobson and I went to bed one night with a $35,000 inventory and awoke the next day with a $25,000 debt. Early in 1922, the Democrats began talking about candidates for county judge. The store had closed and I decided to make the race. When the votes were counted, I won by nearly 300. There has been much speculation about my relationship with the powerful Missouri political boss, Tom Pendergast. He was interested in having as many friends in key positions as possible, but he always took the position that if a man didn't do the job, fire him and get someone who would. In 1934, I ran for the U.S. Senate after serving as presiding judge for eight years. I campaigned as a supporter of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. The election was a pushover for the Democrats, so I came to the U.S. Senate and went to work. Although I was 50 years old, I was as timid as a country boy arriving on a college campus for the first time. I am glad the 75th Congress is coming to an end. I think that Congress has accomplished some great things for the country. It will also be a very great pleasure for me to get back to Missouri and do some fishing. When I was sworn in as senator for the second time in 1941, the country was preparing for war. 
I was concerned about charges that the huge contracts that resulted from the expansion of our defense machinery were being handled through favoritism. I called for a committee to investigate the situation. I became the committee's chairman. In all, it saved the American taxpayers about $15 billion. When the 1944 convention met in Chicago, the president expressed a preference for me to run with him as vice president. Of the United States, the Honorable Harry S. Truman. appreciate this very great honor which has come to the great state of Missouri. After the convention, I went to Washington for a visit with President Roosevelt. He told me that because he was so busy with the war effort, I would have to do the campaigning for both of us and we mapped out our program. The campaign of 1944 was the easiest one I'd ever run in. The Republicans never had a chance. I'm sure that the president and I will have the support of the nation. I saw what the long years in the presidency had done to Franklin Roosevelt. His eyes were sunken. His magnificent smile was missing from his careworn face. He seemed a spent man. I picked up the Bible and held it in my left hand. The Chief Justice gave the oath. The clock below Woodrow Wilson's portrait marked the time at 7.09. Tragic fate has thrust upon us grave responsibilities. We must carry on. So that there can be no possible misunderstanding, both Germany and Japan can be certain beyond any shadow of a doubt that America will continue the fight for freedom until no vestige of resistance remains. Stalin, Churchill, and I met at Potsdam. Russia agreed to enter the Japanese war, and the use of the atomic bomb was decided. But the final decision of where and when to use the bomb was up to me. We are now prepared to destroy more rapidly and completely every productive enterprise the Japanese have in any city. We shall destroy their docks, their factories, and their communications. Let there be no mistake, we shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. In August 1945, the bomb was dropped on Japan and the Japanese surrendered. The day of days for America and her allies. Crowds before the White House await the announcement from the President that the Japs have surrendered unconditionally. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. Reporters rush out to relay the news to an anxious world and touch off celebrations throughout the country.
President Truman appealed to all Americans to help hold the line against inflation. I say to you that we as a nation have it within our hands to make this post-war period an era of the greatest opportunity and prosperity in our nation's history. Housing was one of the hardest problems I had. The shortage had been building up for years. I told Congress that we needed about five million additional homes at once. I also asked for full employment legislation and programs to stabilize the cost of living. High prices were not taking a holiday. Most of Europe was bankrupt, and we were the only nation that could come to its aid. We proposed the Marshall Plan, named for General George Marshall. The countries of Europe would use their full productive resources with whatever help we could give them. The Russians tried to get us out of Berlin by closing off the road to the city. We were forced to make emergency arrangements to have essential supplies flown in. As part of my daily routine, I usually took a walk of a mile and a half at a pace of 120 steps a minute. After you're 50 years old, this is the best exercise you can take. If I had hated my family, I would have left the White House at the end of my first term. Almost all the polls in 1948 showed my popularity at an all-time low. But there was still unfinished business. From the early days of my administration, I insisted on a workable, fair employment practices program and on the enforcement of civil rights as guaranteed by the Constitution. That is why I was perfectly willing to risk defeat in 1948 by sticking to the civil rights plank in my platform. The defection by some of the southern states, notably South Carolina, Alabama, and Mississippi, was something I had anticipated. accept the nomination. <laughs> Senator Barkley and I will win this election and make these Republicans like it. Don't you forget that. directly to the people in all parts of the country. Riding thousands of miles by train and speaking at whistle stops along the way. Today, the Democratic Party stands before the country a living force for peace and freedom. Today, we are rallying our forces for the greatest struggle in our history. In that struggle, I ask your support.
my friend, is the goal of my public life. I'd rather have a lasting peace in the world than to be president of the United States. Thomas E. Dewey, Republican presidential candidate, goes to the polls in New York, happily unaware that he is to be defeated in the greatest political upset of the century. All the pollsters, the self-styled experts, the gamblers, have made him an odds-on favorite. Little wonder Mr. and Mrs. Dewey start the fateful day all smiles. Meanwhile, in Independence, Missouri, the Truman family arrives at the polling place without fuss or fanfare. The president, a hard-fighting campaign behind him, is relaxed and assured. First time since 1916, the United States faces a country so evenly divided in a national election that no one knows, hours and hours after the polls had closed, who is to be the next president of the United States. We now know that Governor Dewey will carry New York State by at least 50,000 votes and will be the next president of the United States. Yet from state after state, as the evening wears on, the impossible is happening. At midnight, Truman's early lead still stands up. The one-man campaign, the thousands of miles, and hundreds of speeches carrying the issues to the people is beginning to pay off in votes, while Democrats cheer. Harry Truman has come through triumphantly in his bid for the presidency of the United States in his own right. I had my sandwich and glass of buttermilk and went to bed at 6.30. And along about 12 o'clock, I happened to wake up for some reason, and the radio was turned on on the National Broadcasting Company. And Mr. Kelton Bourne... <laughs> reporting the situation as it then developed. And Mr. Kelton Barn was saying, well, the president is a million votes ahead in the popular vote we have yet to hear. Truman will be defeated by an overwhelming majority. And I went back to bed and went to sleep. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. The Russian threat to Europe, the Berlin blockade, the communist takeover of China in 1949. All these were sparks that could have led to a third world war. The last and most serious was Korea. We could not stand idly by. We had learned from experience that any other course would have led to another world war. I believe that we must try to limit the war to Korea for these vital reasons to make sure that the precious lives of our fighting men are not wasted, to see that the security of our country and the free world is not needlessly jeopardized, and to prevent a third world war. General Douglas MacArthur was our top field commander in Korea. I've always had the greatest respect for him as a soldier. But time and time again, he showed he was unwilling to accept the policies of my administration. I have therefore considered it essential to relieve General MacArthur so that there would be no doubt or confusion as to the real purpose and aim of our policy. It was with the deepest personal regret that I found myself compelled to take this action. 
General MacArthur is one of our greatest military commanders. But the cause of world peace is much more important than any individual. I decided not to run again in 1952. The best all-around man to succeed me was the governor of Illinois, Adlai Stevenson. After his nomination, I presented him to the convention and said, I'm going to take my coat off and do everything I can to help him win. That November, I voted in independence. Mrs. Truman and Margaret walked with me to the polls. I thought we had lost the election even before I went to bed. The reports the next morning showed that Dwight Eisenhower had won by the largest popular vote in history. For almost eight years, I'd put in long hours, usually 17 hours a day. But it was worth the effort because the results were showing. 62 million people were at work and all had better incomes and more of the good things of life than ever before. We had made a contribution to the stability of the USA and the peace of the world. <laughs>